Hello, welcome back. You're here, you made it. Okay, we are ready for the next part of this book. We are starting out in part one. So the way this book has been edited, the formatting of it is that it is um, sectioned off by parts. There's part one, part two, I think part three, I haven't looked that far. But within those parts, it's um, lots of tiny little chapters. I mean, and I'm talking like half a page, which I don't totally understand in the editing decision there because it isn't like he's jumping around and so you would need that delineation. Uh, it's all one seamless story so a lot of an inexplicable decisions being made at the publishers but whatever. I also want to say too, um, th I didn't say this before, I think it's widely known, I think we all know that this was a ghostwriter who wrote this so I'm not picking Harry apart for some of this questionable writing. I think the reason that I'm so surprised by it is that there was supposed to be a professional at the helm and this is what we get. So, I mean, you can only imagine. Actually, I almost think that Harry's writing would be better. I would hope that it would be considering the fact that he was educated in schools that the best can buy. So, I don't know, maybe it wouldn't have been better. But anyway, I'm going to go through that first part and just break it down into sections and chunks that seem like they should have been a chapter. And in this first, chunk we're going to talk about the actual night uh, when he found out that his mother had passed and where he was physically emotionally the actual event and then w how he spiraled uh, mentally after the actual event um, his feelings about the public his feelings about what was expected of him and his frustrations with the adults around him who were reacting in a way that he could not comprehend I, I, want, I think I'm going to be a little more hesitant and a little <laughs> less vicious maybe in this section because uh, we are dealing with a 12 year old who lost his mother um, and it's hard to be snarky when somebody is young and sad and it does feel like um, there, it could have been handled in a little bit of a different way. But he says a couple of statements in this section that really surprised me. He does not do a lot of showing. He doesn't show you how he comes to these conclusions. He does a lot of telling you. It's problematic in gaining compassion when you don't show me, okay, but but how do you come to that conclusion? I know that's how you feel, but how do you come to that conclusion? So that's kind of what we want to look at here. This is what I want to do this channel. There's so many videos right now about uh, this book. I almost thought, well, why am I adding to it? I'll tell you why I'm adding to it because everyone keeps talking about the big explosive things and everyone keeps being like, oh, you know, he, he's horribly moaned about Camilla and he says that Willie told him to put on that Nazi uniform and then he, his necklace got ripped and the dog bowl crashed under him. It's all these moments that everyone keeps talking about and mocking him and it's mockable. So I'm, I'm here for that also, but there's a lot of nuanced crazy sandwiched between the insanity and I want to talk about that stuff in the middle. Somebody does not just suddenly marry a Meghan Markle. Somebody who is healthy and well and sure of their emotional well-being and does not need a crutch emotionally would never have married a Mar Meghan Markle. I just want to know what led to the explosive incidents and why does he feel like he can say to his dad, hey, please don't marry Camilla. But nobody had better ever tell me I can't marry Megan. Like, where does that hypocrisy come from? Because there's hypocrisy just litters the, the pages of his life. But why did he come to that conclusion? Hopefully he'll show us instead of just telling us that he had a right to these feelings. So here we go. Um, before we get started, y'all know what to do. Y'all got to hit the subscribe button. How are you gonna, how are you gonna get these gems? How are we gonna have this little conversation together about Prince Harry? How are you going to hear the truth of this book? So you can watch this video and then pretend like you never did it. And um, that's one way to live your life. Or you can like, comment, and subscribe. Like a decent human being, okay? All right, I'm glad we had that conversation. Okay, Prince Harry. Part one, section one. This is all about him and the loss of his mother. And I find it really interesting that at the very beginning of this whole section, he talks about the way his memory works. And he talks about the fact that he is not good at um, 
remembering conversations. He's not good at remembering emotions. He's not good at remembering the interpersonal interactions. But what he can do is tell you what the room looked like in which he was told about, about something bad. He can remember the granite steps walking up to Balmoral. He can remember where he hung his coat. He's foggy though on the stuff with the humans. That, that's harder to remember. He does say that his memory feels as though it became uh, fractured after the death of his mother. I can see that, but the problem with that, and I have sympathy for that, the problem is, is that if you are going to now base your life on an incident in which you cannot actually remember many of the things that have happened, and if from that point forward your memory has never functioned the same, it's really difficult to imagine that you are the most reliable person to destroy a family if you can't actually remember what was going on with the family, right? If you don't have any memories of what actually happened, it would probably be safest to leave it to those who do remember what happened. He talks about how right before he found out that his mother had passed away, he'd actually been with her on vacation. And now everybody had gone back to Balmoral where they spent their summers. And he talks about how that had just been a haven for him in his youth. He loved Balmoral. It'd been great. There's a lot of other people who didn't like it. They didn't get it, but he liked it as a kid. And he felt like it was the place to be. But it was harder now that he was older because his mom wasn't there and no one could really explain to him why she wasn't there. And he says that his mother was not with them on that vacation because she was no longer part of the family. And he said that the whole family with the exception of mummy, because mummy was no longer part of the family, was at Bar Balmoral. She'd either bolted or been thrown out depending on whom you asked, though I never asked anyone. Either way, she was having her own holiday elsewhere. Greece, someone said. No, Sardinia, someone said. No, no, someone chimed in. Your mother's in Paris. Maybe it was Mummy herself who said that when she phoned earlier that day for a chat. So, there is this, there's already this cloud at this place where he had always loved to be. And now he's there and his mom's not there and he doesn't know where she is and she's vacationing somewhere and whether she was, she bolted, which is a really harsh word, or been thrown out. He doesn't say which one he decides on. If you thought your mother had run away from you, although I don't think he's ever comes to that conclusion because it, it's very, very clear that she can do no wrong in his mind and that all of her um, reactions to life were no fault of her own, that she was pushed to everything she'd ever done. So I don't think he thinks she bolted. I think that he would very much have believed she was thrown out. And when, when he talks about her throughout this whole chapter, it's a continual highlight on mummy was so sad. Mummy was so sad. Mummy was so mistreated. Um, what else could mummy have done with that amount of sadness in her heart? It's just like he was so hyper aware of her emotional state. So she's not there. And he talks about their life in Balmoral and how how structured everything was versus how it had been when he was with his mom on vacation. So she was a lot more fun and there was a lot more just freedom and it was just um, good times and sun. it was sunny and it was warm and she was warm and she was sunny and everything was perfect. He does talk about how his mother met uh, Dodi Fayed on the vacation that he, they had just previously come off of with their mother and he had not much about him. Um, he was just glad that his mom was happy. Willie felt that way too. Um, he said the guy just sort of chatted him up and chatted his mom up and it was, you know, all right. Not a big thing, it didn't make a big deal. Um, Dodie had given his mother a diamond bracelet and she wore it a lot. So he's like, oh, I guess, I guess they're a thing. They're friends, they're friends, but nobody had said it was any more than that. So he's at Balmoral, he's, it's the night of the incident, though he doesn't realize it yet. He's just, you know, he's eating his dinner in front of the TV. Um, the grownups are downstairs having their big 
lavish two hour dinners, but he's free to sit upstairs and eat his chicken fingers in front of the TV. And he's making all these little comments about his life at Balmoral and about his father and about William and um, how everything just seems sort of, it seems as though when he was with the Royals, it, he was in a house full of old people, which kind of was, you know, his dad was a lot older than his mom. So by the time he's 12, his dad's, you know, up in years. And it seems like it was just a very ordered world, a very um, regulated world, but it doesn't seem like he found safety in that. It seems like he resented the structure. Like it felt like he was hemmed in all the time. And that he, there were some freedoms in, the, in like getting to sit in front of the TV and eat chicken fingers instead of going downstairs at the big dinner. And he didn't look forward to when it was time to go down, when he had reached the age in which he would be expected to attend. And so there's already this dread that's sort of building about what it will be like to be an adult royal. And he goes to bed, he's wakened by his father and his, much has been spoken about this incident. His father, it seemed like his father was being really tender with him. It didn't seem like his father was cold, but his father did not give him the affection in that moment that he seems to have wanted. His father didn't hug him, his father didn't cry with him, but his tone is really affectionate and gentle and sorrowful for their loss. He puts his hand on Harry's knee and calls him my darling boy several times. And what I think is really unfair is that Harry is upset with his father for not being emotionally available in a crisis when he had never shown himself to be emotionally available in daily life. And I think that the idea that we hold people to a standard of reaction that would have been meaningful to us in a crisis is not fair if they've never shown that they were capable of that reaction. And so he really resents his father from this point on for not being what he needed in that moment. And I think it's sad that sometimes we can't be what people need, but we also need grace from other people who aren't just going to reduce us to our worst moments simply because we couldn't give them what they needed. And Harry does that. He's just, at this point, it's almost like he's written his father off. Like, you were never really what I needed. And now when I absolutely was requiring a hug, um, some physical touch, you weren't able to deliver. So I guess you just aren't worthy of my total affection. Anyway, he has convinced, so he's been told, and he lays there in bed for hours and hours and hours waiting to get up. And no one comes to him and no one sees if he's okay. And everybody's in shock and everyone's in their own bubble of shock and nobody's bubble is bumping up into anyone else's bubble. So you're just alone. And in that aloneness, he has decided that his mother's not actually dead. Oh, no, 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 no. She's not dead. Everyone keeps saying they need to go collect the body, but she's not dead. It's just that she's faked her death so she can get away. Because, see, she was so sad that this was the only way. I mean, she's hounded by her family. She's hounded by the press. She's hounded by the public. She just wanted a break. And, of course, it's weird she would do it this way. And he would never have thought that she would let him be in this emotional distress. But she wouldn't have if she didn't have to. And, and all will soon be well because his birthday's in two weeks and she wouldn't miss that. So, in two weeks... He'll find out where she is. And it's really sad because there's nobody to help him realize. There's no one to comfort him. There's no one to help him deal with the reality. So he's already having to construct these false beliefs. And he's alone all the time and he's constantly in his mind arguing about, did she, isn't she, is she alive? Did she fake it? What, you know, and he's all but decided that it was all just a big fake thing and it, it's going to be okay. Which is another thing his dad told him that he really resents his father for saying. His father told him in the moment, it'll all be okay. And he says, what a colossal lie it was. For William, it seems like it, it has been okay. But for Harry, it seems like nothing was ever right again. 
And it's, I think it's because they both required such different handling of their heart and they weren't handled, he wasn't handled the way he wanted to. And I think that for a long time, it would make sense for a child to struggle with that. But as an adult, I don't understand continuing to be mad at people who couldn't give you what you needed in that moment. I'm not saying it wasn't hard, but I don't understand still being upset about it. Anyway, so he's in this altered reality of the truth. And then they even go back and get the body. And his aunt gives he and Willie little clippings of his mother's hair as a keepsake. And he's decided it's somebody else's hair. It's not his mom's. So he's, he's just really struggling with this. And even when he's at the funeral and he's watching the casket being lowered in the ground, up until this point, he hasn't been able to cry at all. And suddenly he starts weeping. And he says, I wasn't weeping because... I had come to any reality that my mother had, was in the box. It's just that I was crying because what if she had been? So already you see just this, this fracture in the way that he's able to handle reality. And there doesn't seem to be anybody who he's close enough with to reveal the contents of his heart. So he's just imploding and no one seems to know it. And that is another thing he talks about a lot in this chapter is that Everybody just went on with daily life and nobody would talk. No one would talk to him about this. He, there's this enormous burden from the public um, that he needs to keep comforting them in their sadness. And they're all weeping and they're all crying. And it's like, well, you didn't know her though. So, you know, kind of an overreaction. And I think that that would be really annoying. You know, if way more than annoying, that would be obnoxious. If you had lost a loved one and then the whole world is crying, but you are so tragically ups and and altered inside that you and 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 just fraught with anxiety that you can't cry but everybody else seems like they can just cry and cry they're on the ground crying prostate in front of the ca castle gates weeping and you're supposed to go out and comfort them and you're so confused that you can't even process what's happening i the whole thing would have been devastating it would have been mentally devastating i think to anybody but to somebody who had to go through that alone and had nobody to talk to i mean it's truly no wonder that harry has struggled throughout his whole life he does seem to have an ally in his uncle charles who didn't want him to walk behind the 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 coffin they thought that that was he thought that that was morose um it was decided anyway that they would do it and then they thought okay well let's just let william do it let's not let harry do it he's too young it's too much um but he says this, he says, the alternative plan was put forward. Willie would walk alone. He was 15. After all, leave the younger one out of it. Spare the spare. This alternative plan was set up the chain. Back came the answer. It must be both princes to garner sympathy, presumably. Uncle Charles was furious, but I wasn't. I didn't want Willie to undergo an ordeal like that without me. Had the roles been reversed, he'd never have wanted me. Indeed, allowed me to go it alone. It's hard to know from that sentence if that is said in kindness or if that is said as a jab at William because we know that he's already called William his arch nemesis. But it's not immediately clear if that's how he felt about William at this time of his life. He says that had the roles been reversed, he'd never have wanted me, indeed allowed me to go it alone. But is it that he wouldn't allow you because he didn't want you to be alone or because he wouldn't have let you have the spotlight you know so the whole issue of his of his name as the spare between the two of them will you being the heir he being the spare comes up he writes all about the fact that oh yeah i didn't mind the secession thing like it's totally fine like i still get to be a prince and that's awesome I don't care if he gets, you know, all the attention in the bigger bedroom. And I mean, I didn't, at the time, I didn't care the, about the fact that I was just there in case, you know, he died and or needed a kidney or something. I mean, uh, what's it to me? I still get to be a prince. Who wouldn't want that? It's like, he's saying the things that he knows people expect him to say because he doesn't want to sound like a complete brat. But then at the same time, it's like, all right, well, so when did you start caring? I don't believe you. Not now, not now that you're over there calling him your, you know, bald arch nemesis. It's just wild. 
I think that Harry is a deeply hurt person. And like I said in the last video, this is somebody who is has a colossal emotional hole in their heart, who is desperately looking for somebody to tell him how he's supposed to feel. Why do you think he chose Megan? Megan has never had a problem articulating her emotions. She has told everyone how she feels and how they should feel throughout her whole life. And why wouldn't he, as he's groping about in the dark, trying to figure out what it is that he feels and how he should feel it and what he should do with life, why wouldn't he be drawn to somebody who had no problems answering those questions for herself or anyone else? This chapter is difficult to be all that cynical about because it is dealing with a lot of really sad stuff. I am really sorry for him in these chapters. It just seems super isolating if it happened the way he says it happened. And it would have been really frustrating having to uh, comfort the public, going out and shaking hands for hours, telling people, you know, thank you for coming, thank you for coming, thank you for coming. And the whole while you're just in an emotional uproar. That's a lot of any, of any person and of a 12 year old, I cannot even imagine. But we're about to talk about his school days. And I have a feeling we're coming on to some stuff that's going to be like, come again? Huh? Okay. Interesting. This section, not, not all that hot for the, for the details. But I do think it's interesting how much she talks about how his memory was really bad. And is really bad. I don't know if that's a great first step in getting an audience to believe what you are toting. Seems problematic. 